Hey, everybody. This is Erica Mello. And just a quick intro to the podcast today. This is a former patient of mine who had persistent pelvic pain. And chief complaint just could not power up hills, had no power in her hamstring, really couldn't walk her dog. She was super hypermobile, as a lot of these complex patients are. And Susan and I look at some really interesting movement patterns that I like to assess and we both like to assess with running. And obviously, her pelvis was not the source of the problem here. I hope you enjoy it. And thanks again for all of the reviews on iTunes. We really appreciate it. Hey, everybody. This is Erica Mello and Susan Clinton. Hello. Hey, how are you? Good. How are you? Good, good, good. I think as of this podcast, we both have come back from traveling, so it's been a, it's been a long first quarter. <laughs> that it has. That it has. Okay, so this podcast is going to be quite unique and probably won't be as long as our other podcasts, so it is, I'll sort of just get right to it, Susan, if that's okay with you. Sounds good to me. Let's go. Okay. So this patient is, I don't think she is still a physio. I think she went back to medical school. This was a physical therapist who came to see me probably a couple of years ago. And she had been, she was actually a women's health therapist, by the way. And her husband was in Baltimore and she, he was doing a residency there. So she could not work as a physio because she was Canadian here in America. So she was doing other things. Anyway, she had been complaining about left SI joint pelvic pain on her left side and a lack of hamstring power, like pushing up a hill when she runs and also in a pull in her left leg, it probably or in her hamstring when she was in yoga doing like a lot of forward bends. And she had been on some courses in the past and they're, you know, and as a subject as well. Mm -hmm. and they're trying to figure out what, what her issue was or what the cause of her problem was. So I'll just repeat it again. Left SI joint, pelvic pain, lack of hamstring power on the left with running, pushing up a hill, and a pull in her left leg when she did some forward bending and yoga. And she also on the side did Pilates and I think she took her Pilates certification program as well. She was a runner and had done a couple of marathons. And I think this all began when she started to do more yoga, started to ramp up the running and then also started to finish her Pilates certification program. And a couple things I'll, you know, I'll just say a few things and Susan, you could tell me what you look at before you even meet the patient. Sounds good. So, since she was a runner and a lot of it had to do with running and walking, she also had a problem walking her dog for long distances when she held it, the leash in her left hand. Okay. And so with a runner, I tend to look at two things right off the bat, just because they're running. I look at th actually seated thoracic rotation because of the arm swing or the arm movement and running. That's what I look at beginning. No matter what their complaint is, I just look at it. And I also look at either a one-legged stance or a one-legged mini squat because we don't run with straight legs. I also tend, I try to watch them run. If I can't do it in the first visit, I'll do it in a subsequent visit. And there's a really good app that I found. I think I mentioned this in the other podcast. It's called Huddle, H-U-D-L. I found this, uh, I learned this at the Shirley Sarman course last year, and it, you can video them running and you can drop it down to a quarter speed, an eighth speed and mm. make marks and things like that. So before I go into her uh, evaluation, that's what I kind of look at with running and then I'll add other things. I don't know if you have something that you do immediately when you see a runner. Yeah, a actually, that's, that's a great point. Before we even move into that, I'm just going to talk tech here for a second. Is Huddle more user-friendly than Coach's Eye? Yes, I think so. Design. Okay, I that's good so. to know. Yeah, yeah. Excellent to know. Okay, so all of you out there who want to who want to record and monkey with um, movement fun. and videoing, huddle, H-U-D-L-E, may be the way to go. I've been using Coach's Eye a little bit, but not as successfully as I would like to. Yeah. Um, so it'll be fun to check this out. I'll look at it. Okay, 
uh, running, walking, long walking, the sagittal plane dominant movement. Mm -hmm. You know, whenever I hear that somebody is spending a great deal of their time in their exercise world in the in the sagittal plane, that always begins to kind of think about maybe some dominant stuff has, you know, dominant patterns in that plane have crept up. And we, we as humans do spend a lot of time in the sagittal plane anyway. So if our only form of exercise is that too, um, I begin to kind of think about pattern development and maybe, you know, like the exclusivity of maybe some variants and some other things around there. When I look at people who are runners or walkers and they're having pain, the question becomes to me is where are their symptoms? Not that their symptoms are always where the problem is, but in this case, and in a lot of uh, patients that I see, it's either, you know, along the front or along the back. And mm -hmm. for her, it's down the back. So it kind of yep. makes me start to wonder about, okay, well, what's going on here? Is this a compression thing that's happening? because of muscles that are switching off because maybe of how she's lining herself up underneath gravity with her running and walking and with walking with a dog with a leash you kind of think about kind of almost leaning back and pulling back running I've seen this a lot with females that tend to kind of just lay back onto their heels a little bit so their whole you know postural area comes backwards and so that could either set up you know compression over time or just muscles that aren't activating because they're not in a position to activate mm -hmm. um, when you're in position like that and you hear about the hamstring stuff then it's kind of like wow why is that hamstring having to work so hard you know yes. and then now yes. she's having problems that way um, so before we even get into the power piece which I think is kind of a, a, a big deal there for me I would be wanting to really kind of understand what that power piece is all about is you know you look at seated rotation the first thing I look at is standing rotation because I usually have them on their feet so, but I, <laughs> oh, that's you know, true. That's, I do yeah, that <laughs> you know but I just no but I mean the idea is that we're going after rotation first I mean exactly. because that's what I look at is like yeah. what does a transverse plane you know rotation look like so in standing, I look at the feet, the knees, the hips, the uh, low back, the T-spine, the, the head, and the eyes. And I, what I usually find all the time is that they never turn their head and their eyes around unless they're coached. You yeah. Know, it's kind of weird to me because we're just blindly rotating, mm -hmm. you know, and as humans, we should be anticipating, which means the eyes and head should actually, if you think about the way humans are set up, should come first, you know, yes. and come around. So I'm not sure if that's just a, you know, a lack of expectation or um, if it's just kind of a trend and pattern that, that um, I'm seeing with clients. So it's very interesting. The, uh, you look at single leg. Um, I love single leg. You can find out so much in single leg. But before I get there, I generally look at a bend over, a squat, and then we'll go to a single leg and a single leg squat and or a hop if I think mm -hmm. they can do it, if they're not yep. in too much pain. Because yep. um, if you're going to implicate the SI joint, um, hopping is usually a good way to implicate it. Uh, yeah. But anyway, yeah, interesting. Cool. So, yeah. so she also sprained, I'm just looking at my notes here, she also sprained that left ankle of hers. So everything was on her left mm -hmm. side, okay. probably in about 2009, and which while she was running. So she was really getting frustrated and she said, is it the lack of strength in my hamstring? I'm like, I said, probably not. It's probably just being, it's just inhibited. I don't think you're, a, you know, you're weak. So what I ended up doing, so the first thing I, in, in, I probably saw her since she was standing first, I probably looked at one legged stands. I mean, I basically did a quick postural screen because my whole thing is if the person has an issue when they're upright, take a, just take a look at quickly look at it, something in standing, something's jumping out at you, make, you know, make note of it. If they had a problem sitting, I would probably not spend a ton of time there. But so I had her stand on one leg and mm -hmm her left side was the main issue. So I said, let's stand on your right leg. Let's see how you do. No problem. She was pretty strong. I didn't see any major shifts or anything that jumped out mm -hmm. at me then. And I actually do everything barefoot. Okay. Yeah. Oh yeah. So I forgot to mention that. So I take yeah, the socks, I take the shoes off everything. Yep. And when I had her stand on her left leg, I had her, she was all over the place. Her thorax shifted left, her pelvis shifted right. She was gripping with her toes. I mean, it was really hard for her to do. And I said, okay, let's start there because if she can't do a one-legged stance, it may be difficult for her to, for her to do a one-legged squat or I'll probably see the same thing, mm -hmm. which I did. So I said, okay, I had her do it a few times. And the first thing that I saw that 
that just went or the first dysfunction or improper movement or whatever you want to call it was her foot. So the minute she stood on that left leg, the toes were gripping and then it went the pelvis and then the thorax. So I said, okay, let me just make some modifications to her foot and see if, if everything looks okay. Mm-hmm. So I got down on my hands and knees and for some things I learned in LJ and Diane's courses, I basically just modified her foot position, neutralized the foot, gave her some, I said, you know, gave her some visual cues. I said, imagine in your brain, your big toes going long, your pinky toes going long, and just gave her some mental imagery to soften the foot. And I sort of lifted her, I had her for basic, for purposes of the podcast, I had her lift her heel up and I just put my hand on her subtalar joint and tried to distract it and neutralize it, had her put her foot down and then we began the imagery. So I know it may be hard to, to imagine if you're listening to this, but uh, if anybody has any questions, they can email me. So when I did that, I said, okay, don't move <laughs> and now stand on your left leg and pro- before I start there, when she stood on her left leg before, without me making any modifications, she had symptoms in her pelvis, in her SI joint. So after I neutralized her foot, she stood on the left leg. There was no pelvic shift. There was a little bit of a thoracic shift still, but much better. And she had no pain. And I was like, okay, I'm going with this to start. <laughs> because I made it, I, all I did was neutralize her foot. And I literally, the pelvis was pretty much pretty good after that. She didn't mm-hmm. have any symptoms. Then I, the thorax was still a bit shifty, but I decided that that was okay for now. Okay. Mm-hmm. It takes time for the kinetic chain to adjust. Exactly. I like the way that you were talking about the feet first and taking a look at it. Um, I don't want people to get the idea that we don't take a look at people in their running shoes because we do, because how they stand without their shoes is just as important as how they stand in their shoes yep. and how they move in their shoes and how they move out of their shoes. That's, that's one. Yep. Um, and they probably wear different shoes when they walk the dog than they do when they run. So those are important, but I love the way that you went straight to the foot because, and when you know, I know you're talking about like neutralizing the foot, I think to take a little bit of the, the moja or the, the, uh, hocus pocus out of it Mm -hmm. is i think there's a million ways that you can get at somebody's foot and i think in one of the previous podcasts we talked about with the the mature uh ballet dancer yeah that i just basically used three fingers you know and just kind of you know went right underneath the navicular you know just to give her enough cueing to realize this is where you know Mm -hmm. just kind of change give a little variance um, think about a different posture for the foot. And I, I love the visualization of the, you know, the toes growing long yep. because that's going to help for somebody who is over gripping, be able to stop over gripping and actually lengthen their arch, their, their medial arch, which is mm-hmm. very cool. So, yep. yeah, no, I think that's great. And, and she's a physio too. So I kind mm-hmm. of, yeah, they're always so much more fun to treat. Yeah. Yeah. And I think she, you know, she, she <laughs> they get it. She was getting it. <laughs> so then I wanted to, since she was, she, she traveled to see me. So I wanted to look at her hamstring power as well, just because that was a main issue for her. So I also, so what I did next before I got her on the table is I had her just do a forward bend and she complained of that pull in the hamstring. Mm-hmm. So I said, okay, let me just, you know, modify the foot again and let's see if that makes mm-hmm. a difference. And it did not a hundred percent though. She still had it, but it was much better. So I got her on the table. I checked her thoracic rotation and sitting. It was okay. It was, she's a bit hypermobile, but she had some compensations where if she rotated to the right, she would side bend to the right. So she wouldn't have pure thoracic rotation. Nothing crazy in my mind at that point in the evaluation. So I, I moved on. Then I put her on her tummy to check her prone hip extension because of that test being, um, I don't know what the current evidence is on that, but that being associated with, you know, hamstring power, hamstring strains. So I literally had her on her tummy, no, no pillow underneath. I had her lift her prone hip extension, had her do her right leg. It flew up, had her do her left leg. It barely moved. So I said, okay, for the heck of it. So when I looked at her doing that, she had a thoracic shift. It was pretty obvious in prone. I, so I couldn't sit there and neutralize her foot and have her lift her leg up. So I said, just do, so I basically did mental imagery. I said, imagine your foot softening, similar cues to what I did in, in, in standing. I said, imagine your great toe going long, your toes are relaxing, you're softening the bottom of your foot. And when she did that, her leg flew off the table. And I sat there going, oh my God, because I didn't really touch her foot. I just had her imagine 
her foot softening. So, and I wanted to invalidate or validate the fact that it was not her hamstring. That was the issue. Right. And that's so cool because you did the same movement. You just gave her a different uh, pathway to approach it. Right. So, because as physios, we all tend to get all up in our head about everything. And she's probably been trying for so long not to engage her hamstrings to lift her leg because somebody told her that she was probably over engaging or something. Who knows? Who knows where it came from? But as soon as you just had her start thinking about the foot going up and the foot changing, she was doing the same motion just from a different angle, just from a yeah. different thought process. It created a different, it created an entrance into the movement pattern a different way. Mm-hmm. That's fantastic. I love it. Yeah, it was, she was, she was fun. And it's, and we were talking about this and I said, you know, we just give patients different options for movement and their nervous systems figure it out. We're just the facilitator, (laughs) I think at the end of the day. So then what I did, so my hypothesis at that point was that because of the lack of push off that she experienced while going up, up the hill was that the, how, how do I want to even describe this? The, I don't, I don't want to say poor foot mechanics, but the mechanics in her foot at that point were affecting the length tension relationship of her hamstring, thus giving her that sensation of a lack of power pushing up. So I explained to her when we, you know, treat the foot, it should give you a better base of support from which, from which to push off of. Mm-hmm. So because she was traveling, I started, and I had done a bunch already in, in that initial visit I started to treat I I treated her started treating her foot so there's a tape that I learned I learned a bunch of tapings in school as well which was so long ago (laughs) but there's a couple tapings that I did learn you know in several courses on how to neutralize the rear foot so basically I just is I did I distracted the medial subtalar joint to put took a piece of Luke um, hypofix and then Luco tape so it's her left foot so I basically put on those on the medial side of her left foot, pulling down on so a very short piece of tape, pulling down on her on the medial part of her calcaneus and just almost like a sling and mm-hmm. just wrapping it around. So I just bade, but I distracted the medial subtalar joint and then just wrapped the tape around. Mm-hmm. And I taught her how to do that. And I also gave her, and I also treated manually. I did some work on her subtalar joint because she had a lot because of the old ankle sprain. I think she had probably some some scarring in there or some restriction, whatever one we, we want to call it. And I, I, I did a lot of that and I just did some basic joint mobilization to the subtalar joint. Once again, just to dec- just to give her nervous system other options. No one had ever treated her foot. Uh, in a lot of the courses, they thought it was her thorax and mm-hmm. um, she had that treated, but she wasn't getting better. And so I sent her actually home with teaching her how to self tape because she could do that. And then with some just basic friction, just self friction massage, the subtalar joint. And then I gave her a a corrective exercise that I learned uh, in one of the discover physio series where she, if she wanted to neutralize her foot herself, all she had to do was almost like, I can't explain this on the podcast, but she almost had to drag her foot and just self distract her foot. Maybe we should put up a, I should have a video on that. Maybe I'll do that and I'll video it and I'll just send it out to people because it's hard to describe. So it was almost like you stand and it's almost on her, you're full in full standing. She has her left foot out to the side in abduction. Then she pronates her foot and then drags Mm -hmm. it and that almost neutralizes or distracts her foot. Mm -hmm. So I had her do that. And then I had her weight shift onto that left foot onto that neutralized quote unquote. Mm -hmm. But so I I basically gave her the tape, the self friction, and then the weight shift onto a self corrected foot with the tape Mm -hmm. or just doing the the dragging and dropping. I just love this because neurologically I'm thinking about all of the different things that are going on. And um, you know, when you bring, you put the leg out into abduction and you begin to drag it in to, to, um, like you say, distract um, the subtalar a little bit and get that rolling, you actually are going to be putting the foot in a position to where when she brings that across that way, her perineals have to kick on. And if you have a chronic ankle sprain or a a big one that never really got, didn't, you know, just kind of stayed into the ankle sprain pattern, the perineals are generally not, they're inhibited. Mm 
They're mm -hmm. not working as well. So they're, they're bringing on, but here's the coolest thing. Now you're bringing in the adductors and the uh, uh, hip abductors. Mm -hmm. Just because you're bringing the adductors on, the hip abductors are going to have to, she brings her as it comes up underneath her leg and as she begins to shift over, you're bringing in that, the, the, the lateral sling there, which is like, uh, you know, fantastic. So now neurologically, she's, she's working her foot all the way up to her hip. Mm -hmm. and you're giving her a different way to get onto her leg so she's not just putting her foot down and standing on it she's having to get up onto her leg from a different position so again a little variance around the pattern and just seeing what the, how the nervous system is going to sort that out but that's i you know i think that's fantastic yeah and no, the you know and the, we've talked about taping before i think the sensory input that taping gives is kind of what does it so it is yeah. more of a neurological thing than it is yep. a you know, than an actual hold the bone thing. Correct. But it is, you know, one of those things. And this is good. This is like really looking outside the box and bringing in rotation and the coronal plane into this person's patterns or sagittal plane pattern, which is yeah, lovely. I, I know. And we've talked about this with, with, although her rotation was okay, runners need to rotate. I mean, yeah. I, I've looked at various over the years, patterns of running. Some people run with no rotation at all and they're fine. Mm -hmm. But some people have got one arm back and that's how they run and like right yeah. rotation. And at some point there, my belief is if they continue to run like that, something's going to buckle and it may not be pain. It may be lack of endurance. It may be fatigue. It may be something and they're going to compensate and compensate until they run out of options. And I think with her, she ran out of options. And speaking of ankle sprains, I think people, I have a big, this is my big soapbox thing. I think people who have, uh, have ankle sprains, like, oh, you know, I don't need to get it treated. I'll, it'll be fine. I cannot tell you the amount of people who've had persistent ankle sprains and they get better. And that's a factor in their current pain presentation, whether it's their foot, their back, or their neck. Because people who have old ankle sprains, if don't get it treated, they should get it treated, even if it's for two visits. Because the... Yeah. Uh, that's just my thing. And I've had a personal experience with that with my own feet. Yeah. Well, I think, I think again, with any injury, we end up with a, we have the, the, you know, our nervous system has the option of so many patterns and it can set up a, you know, over recruitment um, uh, inhibition pattern. You know, it can, it can set up a protection pattern, uh, you know, and that can be in various forms of maybe even a shortened stride length or a lack of inability to go through the rotation through the uh, subtalar joint you know, which can set up, you know, a change of rotation up the spine. So it's not that we're picking on the running pattern itself as the problem, but what we're trying to do is find out where things have gone, gone a little bit crazy in the running pattern. So, you know, it may not be that the fact that this person kind of hangs back on her heels so much is her problem, if that was what it was, for instance, but it's because the, the, there has been, you know, some things that have set up. So now that one leg can't, work in the same way that it did before it's having to work around this new axis of motion and this new change right. and overactivity of the uh, toe flexors and probably medial ankle muscles the mm -hmm. posterior tib and such to keep her on the side of her foot where she you know doesn't really maybe before never was but now is yeah so yep. it's not that you know what i'm saying it's not like we're taking somebody's running pattern and picking it apart and saying you know, no. you have to change this and this and this. We're just looking at a pattern within a pattern. Exactly. You know, to say what's what's really happened and what's different. So somebody who runs a little asymmetrically left to right, if they never ever have any kind of issues that ever happen, they're probably going to be just fine. But if they mm -hmm. fall or hurt themselves or something changes, then that pattern may not be as conducive to it anymore and have Correct. to like help, help them balance. But I think the other Correct. piece of this is, is the more variance you can give somebody around something, the more choices that they have, the more richness of motor control they have. Yeah, so, yeah, yeah. And it sounds like to me she had lost some of her motor control richness. Yeah, yeah. You know, and, and it was this pain protection pattern was kind of rearing its it, ugly head with it. Yeah, and I think when you go on the, a lot of courses and if you, have, if, you, if you have issues yourself, you, you – people sort of pick up on that. And she was just, you know, this is thorax, thorax, thorax. And thorax is important, but it wasn't her primary issue in this case. And, right. you know, I did give her, uh, I'm just looking at my notes, I gave her a couple calf stretches to do because that muscle was so tight, probably pulling on the foot, uh, you know, half foam roll, knee bent, knee straight, I gave her. I also gave her, because I believe she had some access to Pilates, you know, the, the Wonder Box and Pilates. So I had her do some push downs on it yeah. to, 
to, to basically simulate that push off from running. Mm -hmm. And I also gave her a warrior one pose, just thinking my brain, it was warrior one, had her left leg back, right leg in front, had her push off to simulate the push off Mm -hmm. with the back leg. Uh, Yeah because she had been doing the, the teacher training program and, mm-hmm. had, you know, obviously some other yoga poses like tree pose, things like that, that she wanted to do, but I don't tend to give a ton at the first visit, but since she was a physio and she was motivated and not working full time at that point, she, she was on board for doing all of that. And then she, she went away for two months. Okay. And I'll just finish up here. She came back. She was feeling much better and walking the dog was easier. She was able to power up the hills a lot more, just much better. And her balance was much better. So what I did is I just rechecked everything, you know, the forward bend, the one legged balance, the prone hip extension. So the only thing that I found at that point was the prone hip extension. She still had a little bit of a loss of power, although she said it was much better. Everything was significantly better, but she still, even though she could power up hills, she still had a hard time lifting that leg off the table. It was better. Mm -hmm. So the foot, I I still felt that was the primary issue, but she still had the shift in her thorax. So for just the purposes of the podcast and I didn't want, I don't want to get anybody totally confused. What I ended up doing is I just decompressed her thorax a little bit, you know, and had her do some imagery in her head again with her foot because I couldn't do my hands. <laughs> my arm span is not that long. So she's in prone hip extensions on the table. I had her neutralize her foot again with the imagery and I just went up and I just prevented her thorax from shifting to be honest. And mm. her leg was significantly better. So at that point, I think the point that I'm making here is that with the persistent issues, in my experience, there's always a secondary problem. It may be small, but it may be that one extra thing that they need to do to improve mm-hmm. their athletic performance, to get back to full function. Mm-hmm. And I don't, don't need to get into the details of how I treated her with the thorax. I've done that many times on the podcast, but her foot was the primary issue, mm-hmm. but her thorax was probably secondary, maybe 70, mm-hmm. 30, 80, 20. Mm-hmm. So when I ended up treating the thorax a bit, she was good to go. So mm-hmm. the point my, I, w- I was making is that there's, if someone's plateaued and you really found that you've honed in on a primary issue, there's, there's, the longer they've had the issue, there's some small secondary issue, as you know, that's just you need to treat. And it may be their symptomatic part. It may not be. With her, I didn't touch her symptomatic part. But it may be that you may have to do that as well. So that's yeah. her. <laughs> yeah, no, I think that's great because, you know, most, you know, a lot of people would say, okay, so you see this big thoracic shift when she stands on one leg, you know, the first inclination may be to go to correct that, you know, yeah. not, I shouldn't say correct that, to get in and just kind of see what happens when you don't allow that shift to occur. Mm-hmm. How does it fall apart? You know, that may ha- you know, and you may notice that maybe the foot changed when you did it that way. It's hard to say. The idea is, is that that had been done time and time again, and it didn't create the long lasting change that she was looking for. And so sometimes you have to start somewhere, you know, because you may see that second or tertiary thing pop up like big, um, and you may not see it the first time, and that's okay, but don't keep hammering at it is my point. If they come back and they're not any better or it's only minimally better, it's like, okay, well, we've done this piece. It hasn't done the change that I'm looking for. Let me look down the chain, up the chain, to the side of the chain, whatever. But, you know, don't be afraid to look far away from the area to see where you can also come in to, to, you know, to create a difference in their pattern versus just going right for either the symptomatic site or the most obvious piece right next to it. Right. And I think with her, is you're correct, is that I knew the thorax had been treated and she wasn't getting better. Mm -hmm. But the thing that the most obvious thing was her foot. That was the first thing that went. And the first Mm -hmm. thing that went is what I go for as a rule of thumb for me. So Mm -hmm. that's her happy ending. (laughs) So she, she, she's doing well. And uh, I think she's in med school now, actually, to be honest. And uh, good for her. Yeah, you know, and I think that a lot of people, you know, I've been asked before, didn't you do any pel- special tests for the pelvis? No, because it wasn't the driver, it wasn't her primary issue. It, it, and I didn't feel a need to do that because people like this, we, we're not their first rodeo. We're like their 10th, you know, they've had all this done before. So, and it's not acute. You know, 
It's not acute. Right. Exactly. This has been persistent. Exactly. So yep. whether yep. or not SI dysfunction, whether you believe that or not, or SI sensitivity or SI changes have occurred, that may not still may not be the first place that you would go because maybe something else is the one thing that's kind of either keeping the nervous system hypersensitive around there or, you know, or maybe if you are going to believe that, you know, some females may have, especially if they're hypermobile, may have a little bit, maybe a millimeter more of, of movement in that um, highly proprioceptive joint, um, you know, how, how, how are you going to treat it? We're still going to like have to figure out how to change the pattern and get them in a position to where it's not always hurting or always being so hypersensitive. And you have to look down at the foot or you have to look at the knee or you have to look up above and you have to see, gosh, why, why is this happening? She hadn't been pregnant. She didn't come in with a, with a, she wasn't pregnant at the time or early no. postpartum. Nope. She didn't come in with a, you know, a huge fall onto the buttock. She did have an ankle sprain. Maybe that would be something I would look at kind of down the road, but um, I would, you know, I do these other tests first simply to see if I can get a change in the pattern and a change in their sy symptoms right away, yep. then I'm on the right track. Yep. I agree. I can always go in with my manual therapy later yep. and work on something that may be persistently being yep. guarded or persistently still, you know, difficult to get the neurology around yep. the joint to change, yep. you know, with the muscular control. But if I can get in first and make a change in pattern, just much like you did, you know, you yep. just went right to her foot, yep. you got her to figure out how to stand differently and gave her a different pathway for movement right away. She could clear up a lot of her stuff, you know, and then yep. you can see what's left over it's so much right. easier. You know, and on this note is the key with these patients is like, you need to get the buy-in on the first visit. Yeah. I don't care how you do it because they've been everywhere. And if they see the same stuff, they're walking out the door. It's like and the Johnny Cash song. Exactly. So I've been everywhere, that, man. I've been everywhere. You know? yep, exactly. Yeah. Exactly. So there you go. Well, hope everybody enjoyed that one. And I enjoy treating her. So there you go. All right. <laughs> All right, thanks, if you have everybody. any questions, you feel free to you know how to get in touch with us. You should notice that we have a link to um, our, our newsletter email to find out what's going on with Tough to Treat and where we are and what we're doing. We've got some live courses going to be announced at some point and our mentoring sessions are being announced and sign up for these newsletters. Or I guess it's an email actually. Is yes, email. Yeah, sign up for the email for Tough to Treat and, uh, you know, subscribe to us on iTunes or Spotify. Keep leaving your reviews. Uh, there's places for questions even at, on um, iTunes and Spotify that, you know, we can answer for you directly there as well. So thank you for listening and happy patient treating. Bye. Bye.